Hi, Elena, can you hear me? Hello, I can hear you. Good morning, everyone. I I posted the meeting minutes and uh, please add yourself uh, as an attendee. Give it another couple of minutes until people join. Okay, so anyone has any items that I want to bring up before we go through the agenda items? It's going once, twice. So typically we had the stand up, but I think uh, I think it might be better just to kind of let anyone just kind of speak up if they have any items. So we can actually, um, you know, get down to the agenda. Uh, so we can save uh, some time. Uh, so typically we, we run a little bit longer on some of these agenda items. So I think the first item that we have there is uh, CDI from, yeah, so from Renault. So uh, take it away. Definitely. Um. Hi everyone, my name is Renaud. Um, I work at NVIDIA. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Um, I think I've shared the presentation that I'll be presenting on the notes. So um, you'll find the link to it on the notes. Um, let me go in presentation mode. I've left some comments for people just um, for information, so you can also look at the slides that way. Um, so yeah, um, my name is Renaud. I've been a software engineer at NVIDIA for the past few years. I'm a um, tech lead for uh, what we call the cloud native technologies at NVIDIA. Um, today, I want to talk about um, what we call container device interface. And I'll go over some background, just a general idea of what is the state of uh, third-party devices and runtimes and orchestrators, just generally in the cognitive space. Um, why is it that um, just typing Docker or Podman or 
um, run dash dash device um, slash dev my dev node is not sufficient. And I'll give some background on why we think a specific interpreter would be helpful. Um, I, I think I'll go over some real world example that um, we've been hitting with some other vendors in the Kubernetes space, but also um, at NVIDIA and in different, I mean, just real world scenarios. And then I'll, I'll give an overview of one of the solution that we came up with, um, with some of the maintainers um, and of container D and Podman. Um, so, um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just jump into it. So for some background, as I mentioned, um, who am I? Well, um, I've been at Nvidia for three years um, working with some of the open source groups. Um, one of the first tasks that I took on was the uh, device plugin implementation in the Kubernetes uh, space uh, with some awesome people there um, of the Signode and Resource Management work group. Um, I maintained the Nvidia device plugin for Kubernetes. So that. I maintain um, the container toolkit, which is basically our stack for exposing GPUs in different container runtime, whether it's Docker, Podman, Singularity, um, which extends to Kubernetes um, and Nomad. Uh, we have some kind of custom plugin for Mesos, which is entry. And I've been working on um, some of the OCI and RUNC improvements to um, allow hooks uh, for better device supports. Um, so I've been in that space for some time and um, just wanted to call out that um, this is an ongoing topic here that's been, that's been brought up for like a few years. Um, if, you want, if, you, if you're looking at just third party devices and runtimes and orchestration, the ecosystem is kind of a mess right now because pretty much everyone has their own concept of plugins. Um, Kubernetes has a concept of device plugin that you can't really extend to other orchestrators. And really what it does is that um, it re-implements um, it re-implements um, device support at the orchestration level rather than implementing it at the at the runtime. And that's why it's really hard to have it um, um, basically extend to other um, orchestration. Nomad has its own concept of a device plugin that's not the same interface. So uh, Kubernetes, it's basically a gRPC interface. Um, Docker has an entry plugin mechanism. So there's an interface that you can extend through pull requests. And um, um, I think right now NVIDIA is the only plugin. Um, which is not ideal for us. Um, we want to make sure that there's some kind of open standard rather than something that's locked down. Podman has a concept of hooks, which are um, like not OCI hooks, but it's mostly um, a file that you place on the host file system and you describe what OCI hooks you want to have uh, for containers, maybe Maybe, I mean, basically you write an, exp an expression that says, hey, um, if you see a container that has label X, then I want you to call this pre-start hook that's on the host at path uh, A, B, C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna like list all the hooks. Um, so just taking a step back, why is it that when you're a vendor, you want to have you're you're not satisfied with just mounting device dash dev slash dev slash my device? Um, and um, while that was true in the past, and it's still true for kind of simple devices, when you start looking at um, I want to say more advanced devices that uh, vendors have been putting out there, uh, whether it's NVIDIA GPUs because I'm from NVIDIA or um, Intel uh, FPGAs or solar flare NICs, though NICs are kind of a special case here because there's some networking involved. Um, you kind of realize that um, there's a lot more complexity that comes from software um, and there's a lot more constraints and how vendors want, or can and cannot do things. So um, what we, what, what at least we've noticed 
and, and at least for multiple vendors is that a lot of the time um, they need to just expo expose multiple device nodes and it's just not practical to ask the user to expose um, the GPU and then some virtual control nodes. So think Dev NVIDIA Zero, Dev NVIDIA CTL, Dev NVIDIA UVM, or, um, or maybe a, a graphics card, you might want to expose the video, the display, and the audio device. Um, there might be IPCs, files, or even changing ProcFS entries. Uh, so um, when I talk about ProcFS entries, for example, um, you'll find that in Linux, for example, at Proc, Driver, and Video, you'll find the full list of devices. And if you only want to mount one device, uh, ordered by PCI, if you only want to mount one device inside it, or expose one device inside the container, you want to hide the other device that are here on the proc um, There's There's a lot of things here related to just um, Linux stuff. I can go over it if uh, we have more time. Uh, I think it's probably more interesting to go over some of the other use cases. So maybe we maybe as a vendor you want to perform compatible checks. Um, can this container run on this GPU? So an example would be again I'm taking Nvidia here because I'm more familiar with it. But as we as we as we put out new GPUs on the markets, at some point at some point we have some either backwards compatibility or forwards compatibility requirements where um, you've compiled your code for a specific architecture, and um, that the architecture that you're running on is going to be slow, um, and to the point that you might want you might not want to run your GPU on it. Um, so just performing that compatibility check, that hey, is this the right architecture for this? Is this the right GPU architecture for this container? And failing if 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 that is not the case something that is super useful. Um, there's also other use cases where you might want to perform compatibility check. I can go back to this one if you have questions like uh, perform and run your runtime specific operations. Um, I think it's not a big surprise if I if I mention that um, if you're starting up a VM, um, there's diff very different operations that you need to uh, make uh, rather than just starting up a container. Just a simple fact is um, if you're starting up a VM, then you need to load the NVIDIA kernel modules. Um, just to support the other. There's a few other things here to do. Um, and then performing device-specific operations. Um, so shrubbing the GPU memory is now something that we do in the driver, but we've had this request, for example, in the, in the context of um, Intel's FPGA, where they don't want to, like, um, and then I'll mention that in the real-world example in the next slides, but they don't want to give the um, permissions to the user to uh, reconfigure the FPGA, and they they much rather do that um, when they see the container plan on node, and and do that in like themselves as root, so as they may be daemon process. Um, so for security reasons, they can't really like expose um, this reconfiguration to the container. Um, so taking a step back, why is there a need for specification? Um, as I mentioned, I think like the biggest one really is just that runtimes and orchestrator don't really offer the same experience to users because of the fact that the plugin is not like the plugin mechanisms is such a such a mess right now, and that everyone has their own plugin mechanism, and at least to like things that are not even reusable. Um, the Docker GPU support is not reusable in Kubernetes. Which is kind of a weird thing. So you can do Docker run dash dash GPUs, um, but you're not going to get the same experience, or you need to do a lot of uh, workarounds um, to actually get that same experience if you want to do that in Kubernetes. Um, and what that means is, um, well, the user experience is not is not super consistent. Uh, but um, worst of all, you actually end up in maintainability hell. Uh, us maintainer, uh, container uh, runtime maintainers, um, we spend a lot of time just either trying to have some kind of common interface and then some kind of um, external shims for uh, other plugins to call into, or what we've seen more commonly, um, people 
um, either dropping runtime support, so that means that, or for, for runtimes that would be, or that could be uh, easily supported. Um, I think, like, at the end of the day, from a, a plugin mechanism, whether you're running Podman or Docker, really, like, the difference is, at the end of the day, you're still using RunC underneath or you're using CRun, but if you were using RunC underneath, that difference shouldn't, shouldn't really matter from a plugin. Uh, of course, if it's VM versus um, Linux containers, then there's definitely a bit more difference here. Um, but I think the, the point I'm trying to make here is more that um, from a user perspective, currently the behaviors are not the same um, across container runtimes. Um, and from a plugin author perspective, there's a lot of work here to, you either have to do a lot of work to um, um, have a plugin supported across multiple runtimes, or you have to drop container runtime support, which we've seen from um, other, other, other plugin others. Um, and just generally, some plugins don't, don't expose the same capabilities in a consistent way. So we end up resorting, resorting to hacks. Um, the most common one being um, what we call the default runtime strategy, where uh, because, for example, in, in Kubernetes uh, plugin, um, in how it is in the stack, you can't really access OCI hooks. We end up writing a shim for RunC and um, setting up Docker or Containerd um, to point to that shim, so a RunC shim, which will just intercept the spec, add the OCI hook, and then pass them down. Um, so I hope I convinced people for at least from a just theoretical standpoint why that was the need for, for spec. Just going into some of the use case, um, this was one of the conversation we were having um, at UConn with um, 2019 US with other vendors. Um, so what I gathered, for example, of the in the Intel's FPGA use case is that um, the the like they have a fairly simple use case where there's really two things that they need to do. They need to mount uh, multiple devices inside the container, and um, so like that's fairly straightforward. Uh, and they need to be able to reconfigure the FPGA with the correct function. So um, I mean, in terms of security uh, or from a security standpoint, to do that they need to be able to know what is the user intent. So they need to have either container runtime information, sorry, um, the information from the container specification, or they need to have information that is passed down from the user. So whether um, it could be information, for example, this is the Kubernetes use case for example here, uh, where um, it could be passed down through pod labels or pod annotation. And so they might want to do that in a pre-start hook um, at the OCI level. Today, that's what they do. Um, I think um, currently they use cryos to inject hooks inside the container paired with device plugins, and um, they don't have container D support. So that's the use case where they end up excluding, excluding a container. Um, now it's next. Um, this one is kind of, I want to say, um, there is a bit more, um, I think, because of the fact that it's a networking interface, um, we have to take. Um, I mean, we have to look at this use case, um, maybe like it's, it's a bit more nuanced here, um, but uh, this is an example where uh, what actually happens, and this is a bit more common than you would think, is that um, when you are like a device author, you, you, you traditionally have a, um, or you, you traditionally have a kernel module, and then you have some, um, uh, user space libraries that user can call into um, to to talk to your to your kernel module. Um, what we've seen, and this is something that um, we see for Melnux and we see for also for NVIDIA, I'll talk about it uh, in the next slide. Where um, what happens is uh, vendors don't provide guarantees in terms of API compatibility, and so what that really means is if you install driver version. Uh, 1.0.0, you will get um, in your kernel uh, loaded uh, the module version 1.0.0, but you also get installed on your machine 
SO files that are at version 1.0.0. Um, and uh, what happens is that if the vendor decides to publish version 1.1.0, um, the SO files that you get for version 1.1.0 can only work with the kernel module version 1.1.0. So effectively, um, they're not using Semver. Their, their ABI compatibility between the kernel module and um, the, sorry, the ABI compatibility that is here is just um, not guaranteed. Um, and so um, that means that um, if you wanted to ship these SO files inside the container, that container would be limited to nodes with the same kernel version. Um, the solution that we found for many of these um, um, drivers out there is to just mount these SO files inside the container at runtime. Um, it, there's also a few device nodes that you need to mount here. Um, so um, that would be like challenges from a software perspective. And then um, the other use case that I'm, I'm a lot more familiar with is um, the NVIDIA use case where we have these same issues where you need to mount device nodes you might need to mount user land libraries. Again, same problem with the uh, ABI compatibility. You want to mount them at runtime rather than ship them inside the container. Uh, you need to mount Unix sockets inside the container. You need to update pocket entries, perform compatibility checks. I've linked to a document that describes uh, in more details what NVIDIA does. Um, if this is something that you want to look more into, um, and um, we use cryo to inject OCI hooks or Docker's default runtime uh, with what we call a runtime shim or um, for Kubernetes or in runtime's context, we, we, we'd have the entry plugin that I mentioned. Taking a step back, um, we discussed this state a bit at KubeCon with some of the DNRD and Podman maintainers. Um, the idea that we came up with is to have this kind of spec that is based on CNI model. So just a, a JSON file that you drop on the machine and then the container runtimes are just, and it just describes what are the devices that you want to expose that are available on the machine. So think of a JSON file that just says, hey, you have GPU zero, GPU one, or Intel FPGA one or two. Um, and describe some of the operations that you want to perform to make the device available to the container. Um, and some examples of how the runtime or how the CLI should implement um, this, this, these plugins. I've explicitly um, talking through with some of the maintainers of container DE and Podman, as well as the signal maintainers, we've explicitly um, decided that resource management is something that is not and um, that should not be really addressed at the container runtime, and it's not addressed today. It's something that should be addressed at the orchestration level. So it's been kept out of the spec. So an example here is, I don't know if this is big enough for everyone, would be that um, you have a vendor.json file here in this standard path at CCDI. Just describe the CDI version, it describes who you are, so vendor.com slash device, and then it describes the devices. So here there's a single device that you call my device, and it describes the operations. And would be here that inside, or when you, the runtime, um, see um, runtime run dash dash device vendor.com slash my device, what you do to the spec is that you would merge um, these two device nodes uh, and add them to um, the container spec. And so um, here I've given an example of what runtime you might want or what CLI example you might want. So um, there's a verbose example here where you would do runtime run, um, and this would be the fully qualified name, vendor.com slash device equals my device. Uh, but you might want to try and infer this through uh, dash dash device equals my device. There's only one vendor or one device that has a specific name. And maybe we can think about a special uh, case here where you would have this um, all uh, string um, that just says expose all the devices um, that uh, vendor.com has. Um, 
container spec really specifies the operation to be performed. Um, and, and there's another field here, if you've noticed here, container spec is device specific. So here it maps to my device. And um, there's another here, um, in same, um, a field that would be named container spec two, but it would be a level higher. So um, not at the level of the CDI device fields, but at the level of the um, just general container. And um, if any of the CDI devices mounted inside the container, um, you would you would also merge this field. So for, this would be the case, for example, if you had a control device, instead of saying for each device, adding a container spec field that says dev my device control, you might want to mount only this device control once inside the container or expose this device once inside the container. Um, so that would be this example here where um, it just um, it is a, a an operation to be performed if any of the devices are requested for a container. Um, devices are not the only kind of um, um, operations that you can perform. Hooks would be an example here. So let's say you want to expose um, SO files inside the container. Um, the next problem you have you are faced with is um, you either need to update the environment variable to point to um, these, the LD preload environment variable to point to these SO files, um, which can be breaking in some cases because you want to make sure that you're not overriding the user's um, LD preload uh, library, or you just run LD config before the container starts. Um, and the last one is you might want to have like runtime specific operations, but I think these are all, these are more details, or at least that one is more of a detail. Um, that's the general gist of the spec is really to just say, I have devices that or just, just tell the runtime, I have devices that you can use, here's how you could use them. Um, and then uh, actually probably, I probably forgot to, uh, that's probably a slide I won't go over. Um, but generally, um, we've talked about how a runtime might use this. And the idea is that um, at the end of the day, what we want um, the runtime to be doing is instead of, or sorry, the orchestrator to be doing is instead of re-implementing their own device plugin, we want the orchestrator to call in runtime run dash dash device my device rather than do runtime run dash dash device dev NVIDIA zero dash b lib slash um, lib CUDA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's pretty much it. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, um, I have a question. So uh, have you actually worked with some of the runtime uh, uh, projects? And uh, is there some sort of consensus about, um, uh, you know, coming up with a common interface for devices or? or? So, uh, at least the two main um, runtimes that I was talking to was um, container in the end pod. Um, and um, this was in the context of KubeCon 2019. Um, generally, the, 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 I think the on principle, um, people agreed that there needed to be some kind of way for third party device supports and that the, the, the current state of the ecosystem was a mess. I think Podman was kind of, or at least um, Podman maintainers were kind of interested in the idea and they said, just send PRs. Um, I've been focusing right now on just um, getting the OCI hooks first. And I wanted to make sure that there's like a bit a bit broader consensus than just having like the 101 uh, specification or plugin. Got it. And, and how would it work with something like Kubernetes? Because like you, um, you would um, specify in your workload the device that you want to use in the pod or? So with or... Kubernetes, you'd still have a concept of device plugin. Um, it's just that this device plugin would never would not uh, be uh, doing um, operations that are uh, runtime specific. So if I, it looks like I forgot to finish this slide, but the idea here is you would have your runtime device plugin. 
Oops. Sorry. Um, the goal here is not really to have your runtime exposed to the orchestrator, uh, what device are on the host. The goal would be to have your um, orchestrator ha still have a device plugin mechanism here. Um, is right now the device plugin in Kubernetes. Um, the model that it, it, ha it has it has really two responsibilities. The first one is that it talks to the orchestrator, so to the Qubit here, uh, and it says, I have three nvidia.com slash GPUs on the machine. And the Qubit can now advertise in its um, um, status field or in its um, um, capacity and or resource field, hey, I have three nvidia.com slash GPUs on this machine. Um, sorry, and, and the device plugin in Kubernetes has actually three responsibilities. Um, the, the next one um, is that um, currently what happens is when a pod lands on, a, on an orchestrator or on a node now, um, the, the, the Qubit will select what device it wants to be exposing to that computer, right? Um, it then goes to the Kubernetes device plugin and says, can you tell me what are the operations that needs to happen for me to um, expose this device to this container? So the qubit might respond with one of, um, with either environment variables, either device nodes that need to be mounted or um, libraries or files that need to be mounted inside the container. Um, it then goes to the, orchestra to the runtime and says, hey, create this container and here's the CRI spec and I've already merged the device nodes and the um, environment variables and the uh, files. And uh, the last responsibility of the KDS device plugin here is just monitoring the devices for health uh, issues. Okay. So what I'm what I'm suggesting here is that um, you take away this um, like mount um, environment, this 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 space here where Kubit goes to the device plugin and asks, "What do I need to do?" And Kubit would just go directly to the runtime and pass down in the CRI spec. Um, hey, I need you to expose slash devs, or not slash dev, but NVIDIA zero or my NVIDIA GPU. And then the runtime would then just read the spec and move on. Got it. So have you looked at the runtime class? Uh, so maybe specifying this, uh, some of these uh, parameters in the runtime class where like a user would say, oh, uh, this pod needs to use this runtime class that has a certain GPU or a certain device. Um, would that be yeah. something that? That was one, kind of one of the things that we thought about and we were discussing. Um, I think just generally, we were, we were more looking into reusing um, the general OCIs, um, sorry, the CRI spec, but taking a step back, the problem here is that runtime class is Renetti specific. And at the end of the day, we want to try and break down, bring down the plugins for devices to the runtime so that orchestrators can reuse them. Um, that's, that's, that's the real problem with the device plugin is that right now this, this whole operation of how do I provide the same container, whether you're on Nomad, Kubernetes, Mesos, or even just Kubernetes using Docker and Docker, um, it's not a solved problem. And that's, that's the big problem here is that if I spawn a container using Kubernetes and that runtime is Docker, it's like as a plugin author, I have two very, or I, I have two different stacks, right? Um, I can either use my plugin here that is the runtime plugin that is in Docker already today, or I can use my device plugin. And We've, we've managed to find hacks and workarounds through this like default runtime for Kubernetes. Um, but that's, that's not really the path that we would like to be taking. Um, when I'm asking a user to have a default runtime, or even if, I, if using this run, the runtime class is, is not really, like I, as, as an NVIDIA like third party like plugin vendor, I don't want users to be using a custom runtime. I, I want to hook into the runtime and just tell it, here's what you need to do for, for my devices to be available. 
right? That makes sense. Anybody else has any other questions? I'm the only one speaking. I have a question about, you kind of touched on it, like you don't want people reprogramming FPGAs. Yep. You no, know? and uh, same kind of thing with NVIDIA, like NVIDIA SMI allows you to control your GPU, right? And change things, manage it. How do you handle that with like the privilege level that people have, what the access level they have to these devices? So um, it really depends on the use case. Um, when you're training uh, GPU models, most of the time you're going to be requesting one, two, three, eight uh, multi-nodes model. Uh, and in that context, if you have the full GPU, um, the expectation is that you're going to have, or you're going to have access to reconfigure it. But more recently, we announced MIG. Um, that was last week, so you'll see that at the uh, next GPUs where you can partition your GPUs and smaller GPUs. In that context, um, when you have access to these devices, um, we have, um, like, it depends on what, are, what devices are mounted, basically, inside your computer. Um, so if you, basically, the idea is if you have access to a full GPU, um, the security model is you own the GPU, and you should be able to reconfigure it. If you have access to only smaller partitions of the GPU, then we don't assume that you have the permissions to reconfigure it. And is that part of what needs to be standardized here? That whole security model? No matter so, whether you have Xilinx or you have NVIDIA or you have, you know, uh, Intel? I think like here right now, um, the expectation is really that we want to be able, um, I don't know if it's standardized, but the, the idea here that we're trying to get to is that we want to be able to um, remove permissions from the container for, for users to do things, um, if, if that makes sense. But right now, um, at least w what the problem was for Intel here is that today they need to be either doing some hacks around the runtime or to delegate the permission to reconfigure the FPGA to it. And that's, that's, that's the request here in terms of security is to not delegate the, use, the, the permissions to the users, is to be able to have some kind of standard hook for the runtime for, 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 sorry, for the plugin to be able to, to, to do um, to do that, these operations. So in, in a way, like that specification will allow us to have a more robust security model. Okay, instead of just on or off, you're privileged or you're not, they want something in addition to that? I mean, yeah. I, okay. Basically the idea is that like, I mean, it's, yeah, we don't want to be providing all the privileges to the users. Um, we want to be able to do that as part of the hook lifecycle. And the, and the way they would do that is, for example, here by specifying a um, create container or a runtime container hook um, in, in, in that spec. And when the container gets, or when that hook gets involved, it would reconfigure the FPGA for that container. But in, t in terms of security, you uh, but uh, that will be exposed to any container, or uh, there will be some sort of um, permissions. You know what the uh, how the container is restricted, right? So maybe I, th I think maybe. really it's it's going to to be up to how a, a device has or what is the security model of each device. So that's that. It, this is definitely a, a tricky-ish question. Um, it's hard for me to talk about people like Intel or um, or others. Um, but at least from an, from Nvidia's standpoint, um, definitely when 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 we're talking about security and especially given like this sub GPUs, being able to expose the right device nodes, being able to expose the right pocketfs entries will allow us to reduce the permissions um, that a user has, if, if that makes sense. 
Got it. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, in the security model will have to kind of work, be worked out, right? So, um, and yeah, maybe specify, right? So, yeah. uh, hi. Uh, so we have the Q, uh, we have the Kubernetes at the top, and then the kubelet, and yeah. then the Kate's device plugin, and then we have the uh, CDI plugin within the runtime. Yeah. So that's the layering. So uh, what would be the division of responsibilities between each of the layers? Uh, uh, if, for example, how, how would we, sh how would I sh uh, ask for or share, uh, let's say ask for I, a Kubernetes container to say, okay, I, I need to run a workload. Right. And then how does that go down to the bottom level uh, right now? If, um, that's, I mean, that's a great question. I think that was the purpose of that slide that I never finished. Um, um, so I think just, um, I'm, I'm gonna take out the whole um, shared devices because shared devices is really kind of, again, it's a device specific problem and it, it's up to how the device implements it. Um, there is some part of how do you expose that in the resource management, but let's let's take away that topic because it's kind of difficult to talk about. And um, let's just focus on I want a single device. I want a single full device. Um, so the way today it works in, in Kubernetes is um, you, Kubernetes, um, you really just um, uh, expose it in your specification by just requesting for um, that specific resource. So. You go in your pod spec and you add a resource limits nvidia.com slash gpu intel.com slash gpa um, solarflare.io um, slash nick. Um, and so I'm going to assume that your scheduler already found the net. Well, before even that, um, you um, are going to want to have nodes advertise that there are resources on that node. And I think this is definitely where um, the device plugin comes into play. You want to be able to deploy or dispatch um, a container on yeah, all your nodes to figure out through LSPCI, is there, for example, a GPU, a NIC, or like a NIC that I support on that machine? Yes. So this is the time that the, the device plugin would then start telling Kubelets, hey, um, I've seen a, a GPU, I've seen a device here. It's not the right way. Um, here you go. So um, that's that first step here where the device plugin calls into people. Maybe that device plugin installs a driver, maybe that device plugin installs um, that hook. So maybe that's that's the point where this device plugin goes into or like has a mount on Etsy CDI and just drops this file onto the host. So if we were to take NVIDIA GPUs, LSVCI, um, oh, I see NVIDIA GPUs, install the driver um, that we have a drive, what would be called the driver container here. Um, and then drop the um, drop the spec uh, at that specific path. So this would be that phase one bootstrap. Um, phase two, a user comes in, presents this kind of pod spec, um, gets um, submitted to the API server, scheduler picks it up, Figure it, figures out which node it should get, you should land on, um, assign the node. Kubelet pulls the spec from the API server, and um, this is where basically Kubelet goes into this uh, loop mode, where it figures out which device should I be assigning to. So um, you might be familiar with the topology manager and other plugins that are out there. Um, this is why you want Kubelet to be figuring out which device it should be assigned to, um, because it then talks to them something like the topology manager. And then at that point, it calls into the runtime. So you have something like more like this that starts going on. So let's go API server here. So the device plugin doesn't come into play uh, in that loop. Kubelet basically just talks to the runtimes through the CRI here. Um, and 
because if um, here we would be reusing this, this dash dash device, um, it's kind of nice here um, where you might, you're, you're not going to be conflicting with the existing uh, device model. Um, you might need to write a bit more like uh, formatting support here, but uh, basically the runtime is getting something along the lines of Docker run dash dash device NVIDIA zero or my NVIDIA device and then the container image. And that's where the runtime reads this um, CDI file, figures out maybe there's just some static specification. It's just only some devices that I need to mount. So I'm going to take Docker here for the runtime. Uh, and in NVIDIA's case, um, there's definitely some devices that you need to mount. There's definitely some files that you need to mount. But there's also a, um, a hook that you need to invoke. So when Docker then calls into container D and ultimately into run C, um, the spec that is passed down here contains uh, not only these device node hooks, uh, but also um, these OCI hooks, or sorry, these device node mounts and these file mounts, but also the OCI hooks. So at that point, run C has the spec and all the information to call the actual hooks or the actual um, yeah, the actual hooks, uh, whether it's inside the container or outside the container. So here, maybe it's going to call ldconfig inside the container before it starts. So I have a question. Yep. So CUDA is like five gigabytes or something, right? Um, I think we have multiple containers. Uh, the develop container is 2.5 gigabytes, uh, but the runtime container is fairly small upward, well, comparatively small, upwards of 200, 300 megs. TensorFlow is kind of bigger. So does that end up in the container for each of these? Or does that, like, are there multiple copies of that all over the place? Or is there one place where that lives? So um, there's a really nice document that describes a bit uh, what we do in the container runtime. Um, the answer is parts of it end up in the container, parts of it end up on the host. Um, I let me see. I, th I think we we have a general um, scheme here. Yeah. So I'm so, just wondering if these containers end up being incredibly large, or if that's avoided somehow. Uh, in deploying these containers, end up being incredibly large. Um, I, the problem is not really CUDA. The problem is how the ecosystem has been set up um, and dependencies that are there. Um, TensorFlow images are usually upwards of two gigs because of all um, the tools that they need inside. I think it's kind of um, maybe adjacent to the topic. Uh, and yeah, it's, to... I think that's a bit off topic, but I was just curious. Uh, if, 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 I'm happy to answer thing. any of your questions on the uh, on the yes, side. Okay, we can skip that. Um, Should we go back to one more thing I need to poke at? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so we. Uh, you were filling the, um, the yeah the bottom half there right yep. so um, the uh, CDI spec itself um, you know the implementation uh, do you have any guidance on the implementation or is it just uh, you know, what are the hooks uh, what is the content of the JSON um, and is is that basically it or uh, is there more yeah, the so it's, it's basically, I, I have the broader spec here uh, in my name uh, right now. This is mostly a draft. Uh, it's definitely just mostly a JSON file here. We, you have a bigger understanding here, and I wrote a, a spec on MD here that just describes the different fields. Um, I think just, um, I'm not going to go over each of them, but in terms of implementation, I think it really is going to be mostly um, depending on the runtime. We could expose some kind of library in that repository too that just processes the uh, processes the JSON and GoLang, just um, container D, run C or Go, um, and runtimes could import it. Um, that's that's definitely a possibility. Just making it easier for people uh, generating this spec and Go generating the unmarshalling code. Um, but the merging part is probably going to need to happen at the container runtime level. 
the thing that's not clear to me is basically um does this need to happen in run c or does this need to be to to be happening in container d for example right uh, so there is no socket file there is no no uh, nothing that is need to be started before and waiting for yeah, it to happen nothing like that the goal here is okay. we want to make it plain simple plain dumb to invoke uh and we especially don't want demons we especially don't want grpc connections um i think that was one of the, um, the concerns was we don't want to add yet another grpc hub okay so it's mostly here's a bag of parameters pass it down and th these are the different things that you yes. need to call in a sequence you call and this at a specific time you call the other one later something like that right yeah it's, it's a transformation pipe well it's not even a transformation pipe it's just here edits that you have to make to the oci spec and we just leverage hooks that are already here or yeah hooks that are already here but not exposed to or to people or when you are at the darker level or at the or at the sorry at the kubernetes level yeah, it looks good right now thank you yeah, so um uh question is d uh so i brought up the idea of uh starting a working group for this uh i mean are you interested in doing this or um I'm definitely interested in doing this uh, making making that space better is something that's super beneficial for us uh, because of how difficult it is today to deploy stuff for our users yeah okay so i have a question for amy do you have in anything uh or standards that we have for starting a working group. I know some of the six are, have already uh, started the, some working groups. Yeah, there isn't really a policy for that, but if you want to be able to actually form a working group, um, what's generally happened is people form a working group. Yeah. So like, oh. let me know what you need basically. Cool, yeah. So yeah, I think uh, we can get started with that. Um, uh, I mean, I think I, I would just kind of uh, go back and look at some of the other six and how they've done it and yeah, and, and get started. Okay, um, I can probably sh um, share an invite with some of the other maintainers. I think main point of contact has been um, Renault uh, on the Podman side and Mike Rowe on the container D side. Um, I think just um, there's been some activity in how do you expose also the OCI hooks on the container D. So. And I think just generally other vendors like Intel would be super interested. Um, that looks too. Yeah, so ideally we want to gather um, as many folks from the different projects. Uh, so uh, there's consensus about the, you know, the specification. Right? Yep, definitely. Cool. Anybody else has any other questions? Uh, uh, we have another item on the agenda, but I, I don't think we're going to get to it because uh, we're, it's almost not, uh, up, uh, 9 and a, nine a.m. in Pacific time. So, But uh, I think we can just kind of fill in those uh, seven minutes uh, with any other questions. I'll try to make sure that this slide is done for the next time. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, my guess is that if you if you get started with a working group, I mean, uh, you, you could actually have um, uh, separate meetings, you know, in the working group. Mm -hmm. And then, and then uh, some of the folks that are interested in working on the specification uh, would actually, you know, discuss more of the, more of the details, right? So. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, um, if there's no other questions, thank you for hearing me. Yeah, thank you. It was great and uh, um, very uh, informative. So Kevin, do you, you wanna actually uh, give a brief introduction of what you wanted to talk about for uh, Cube Edge? Yeah, uh, thank you. So I think maybe I cannot uh, go through the whole slide, but I. So basically, I just want to uh, briefly introduce what, uh, where we are, what we have done, and uh, uh, so I also want to start up 
the uh, incubation process. Yeah, so the incubation process is, uh, there's a presentation here in the SIG and uh, there's, um, I think it's a review um, of a template and then uh, it gets uh, reviewed later by the TOC and then the TOC finds a, a, a person who drives the due diligence. Okay. And if I think everything uh, turns out to be okay, then it goes for a vote on uh, the TOC for incubation. So that's generally the process, right? So uh, uh, um, maybe Amy can fill in a little bit more details about the incubation process if she has any more details. No, yeah, you had it pretty much straightforwardly. Um, uh, and, and welcome, Kevin. Um, it looks like we'll probably get to you next time. Okay, so actually I have a question. Uh, so the due diligence must be started by some TOC member, right? That's good. Okay. However, yeah, I think the presentation that... can happen ahead of time. Like you can start off with the presentation and it's fine. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I think um that's the the official process um but if you need any help from the sig or uh helping out you know gather some information you know the, the sig is also happy to help right so um you know uh, reaching uh typically it's like a toc um person that uh reaches out to say the the companies or, or organizations uh using the project in production uh, and and uh, ask questions or something and, uh, during the, the process, uh, and then you know I guess comes back with with some uh, feedback, and, and 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 also gets documented in in the in, in the doc uh, the official document. Uh, yeah, Alina Alina is here. Um, uh, I would be happy to to run a due diligence for Cubage. Thank you. So I also want to know, uh, is the presentation required to be finished before the other uh, things started or we can go in parallel? You can work in parallel, that should be fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think we're at the top of the hour. We have two minutes, uh, anybody else wanna uh, bring up any topic or anything that Patrice, sorry, um, can I quickly ask a quick question here? Um, yeah. One of the problems I have right now is that the spec is currently um, posted under uh, my like GitHub account. Um, is there a way to like have some kind of, I want to say more official account or like repository here? Uh, meaning like a CNCF uh, type of? Uh, Maybe uh, it's an incubator. I'm not super familiar with the process. But just having some kind of like common repository that's not my personal <laughs> GitHub handle. Um, I think if it's, it's a project, uh, you can start a, a an organization on GitHub and actually uh, put it there. I'm not really sure if GitHub uh, charges you for creating an organization, so you can. But it, but if not, then you can put it in there and then. Uh, yeah, and, and it's just public, right? It, yep. I mean, it's, it's open source, so um, yeah, uh, yeah. I see what you're saying. You're using your personal account, right, for this, right? Yep. So, yeah, so I, you can put it under an organization, and then uh, once the working group gets uh, created, then then everybody can just kind of like uh, work out of out of that organization. Uh, uh, okay. I don't think there's any specific process for that, right? So yeah. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So yeah, thank you everyone for uh, attending. Uh, and yeah, that's all we have for today. And stay safe. And we'll see you next time. Definitely. Have a great one. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, so Have a good one. Thank you. Bye.